So, Sunday morning, my words are God's words. It was my favorite word for a day or two, extrapolation. And again, extrapolation basically means you look at some truths, and because you've got what you consider are truths, scientists will do the same thing. They'll look at scientific truths, and they'll figure if this is true, I wonder if this is true. And then they'll do experiments on that to see if that's also true, are they're not connected. And so, uh, much doctrine, just about every preacher who made his own notes, he's not preaching from denominational books telling him what to preach, he's making his own notes, and the world is full of evangelical preachers who do their own study, make their own notes. And they read some verses, and they begin to extrapolate. Jesus, or the Scripture said this is true. Then I wonder if this is true. And then when you get to the I wonder if this is true, your mind begins to work, can I prove that's true by other Scripture? And if it isn't, you might not totally eliminate it, but you'll say this could be true as opposed to this is true. So we talked about extrapolation Sunday morning. Now this evening, we're going to talk about those pesky first century Jews and how they fought against all those who were getting saved because they did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah they had looked for. And so they thought every Jew, like all the apostles, Every Jew, like all the apostles' traveling mates, every Jew that had been converted to Christ through the preaching of the gospel, they didn't like. And there was one they really didn't like because he used to be a Jew and a very good Jew and a Pharisee, a religious Jew that taught other Jews the Jewish faith. And now his name was Saul of Tarsus, Now he takes his Roman name. I mentioned to you that his father had some, was a man of means, and he bought Roman citizenship. So even though they were Jews, they were Roman citizens. So I'm assuming that the change from Saul to Paul is because his name in the, and not the Jewish language, but his name in the language that the Romans spoke would have been pronounced differently. And so in English, now it's all in English to you and I. So um, so we always turn it into from Saul to Paul. Saul the Pharisee to Paul the Apostle. So Paul was known for turning the world upside down for Jesus. Heard a preacher on the radio on the way from work to church. He was really challenging Christians. He was saying it's our job, no matter what it cost us, to change the world for Christ. It's our job to let people know what's at stake. What the blessing is if you get saved, what the cost is if you don't. It's our job to carry the Word of God to anybody and everybody we can. And it was quite a challenge and uh, certainly true. Um, He doesn't believe in becoming totally politically motivated, but he does believe without bringing out political parties, you point out to the country what, what, what they're doing that's ungodly. You point them to the Scripture. And he mentioned things like, in the Scripture, God made a male and female. That's it. So all that other stuff is in opposition to God. And uh, so, it was a pretty good sermon, I have to admit. So we're going to go and finish 1 Thessalonians 2. Because we were talking about extrapolating, we just did verse 13 Sunday morning, and then added some other Scriptures from other um, 
other books of the New Testament. But this small, our evening we're going to finish the final seven verses of 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 14 to 20. So the scripture said, For you, brethren, Paul writing to the Christians in Thessalonica, For you, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. So he's saying, You folks left in all likelihood left Israel to Gentile country because every Christian Jew, every Jewish person who accepted Christ was being severely persecuted by the non-saved Jews. And so that caused Jews to uh, flee Jerusalem and Israel and um, go to Gentile countries. And many of them carried the gospel with them. So he's saying... um, when you were in Judea, which is Israel, part of Israel, when you were in Judea, um, you suffered like your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. So all the Jews that were in Israel for a while, for a certain period of time, were being persecuted by the traditional Jews, not the saved Jews, the ones who were still practicing Old Testament Judaism, did not like those who were saying, we're done with Moses, Jesus has come. They didn't like that. They loved Moses. And don't get me wrong. Moses was a godly man of God who um, uh, did some amazing things, led uh, Jews out of Egypt in miraculous form. God used him to do so many things. He was a great man of God, but he was... uh, living under, God used him to bring it forward, he was living under a different covenant with God than you and I are. The covenant we live under, it's like a contract. I always talk about you got an old car, I got an old car. And I don't know anything on it, so it's a bad example for what I'm going to say. But if you have a, a current car and it's getting old... And you haven't paid it off yet, but you want to trade it in and get a different car, a newer car. You don't have to have your car paid off to trade it in. If you still have to you dicker with the car company, you think your car is worth $4,000, they think it's worth 3000 And as you argue back and forth over the table, you somehow settle on $3,500. Well, when you buy this new car, they're going to add $3,500 on top of the cost of the car because you didn't finish paying for that car, and it's got to be paid. And that will pay off the old loan, and now everything will be incorporated into the new loan, and your payments will go way up. You'll be paying a lot more money. And uh, that's how it works. The law of Moses was an old contract. It's not quite like buying and selling cars. You don't have a trade-in when you go from the law to grace. You just step freely into a brand new covenant with God. Under the age of the Jews, once they were delivered from Egypt, God gave Moses this amazing, the burning bush, talking to him out of a burning bush, He did amazing miracles, uh, and God used him to deliver all the Jews from the most powerful country in the world, maybe at that time, Egypt, and they just walked out. And Pharaoh wanted them gone so bad because of all the plagues, they gave them all kinds of money. They left, these slaves left Egypt rich. At first, Pharaoh said, I'm not going to let your people go. But after ten plagues, he said, get them out of here. And they were severe plagues. Uh, The one that was the backbreaker was the firstborn in every house that did not have uh, uh, blood from a sacrificial 
uh, lamb on the doorpost uh, and, and uh, you know, on the two sides and over the top of the door. If you didn't have that, the firstborn son in every house that didn't have that, when the death angel passed over, God killed him. Well, this didn't just impact... Most Jews did what Moses told them to do. For, so they were... Uh, most Jews were saved from that horrible tragedy because they put the blood where it belonged. But the Egyptians, on the other hand, wouldn't dare do that because Pharaoh wouldn't like it. But when that was all over, Pharaoh said, take your people and get out of here. And the Egyptians wanted them gone. I mean, they're all mourning the death of the firstborn male. They're giving them money. They're giving them everything. Get out of here. And uh, there were about two million Jews who left Egypt that day. It's what the commentators tell us. Somewhere around two million Jews. All right. So, these Jews in Paul's day still want to follow Moses. They like this nice tight-knit system that Moses gave them. Do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. And by the way, give us 10%. They loved that, and they didn't want to give it up. But Paul said the problem with the law of Moses wasn't the rules. They were godly. They were holy, just, and good, Romans 7 tells us. The problem is, the law didn't give you the make you a new creature like getting saved does. So it didn't create you anew where you could keep the law. So you had all these rules with no ability to keep them. Paul wrote, if there had been a law given that could have given life, what he meant by that, if the law of Moses had made people new creatures, like salvation does, then righteousness could have come from the law. But the law didn't do that. So, he's saying, you guys are being persecuted, just like some of your fellow Jews um, who are still following Jesus. They haven't given in to persecution and forsaken Christ. Paul now takes it back to a subject uh, he introduced in chapter 1, the Christians in Thessalonica were being persecuted for the faith. How was that happening to the Thessalonian believers? The same way it was happening to Christians in Judea. The Christians in Thessalonica and the Christians in Judea were both suffering persecution simply because they were Christians. And by the way, that's happening around the world today. There are countries in Africa, various faiths, I don't, uh, some of those in Africa would be, um, uh, oh, what's the word for Muslim I'm looking at? Would be uh, of that type of faith. But there are a lot of other faith, Hindu, Hinduism, all kinds of things. And um, there are countries Christians aren't welcome. You get saved, and we got missionaries. You remember TBN put up these satellites all around the world and found people who could speak like all kinds of different languages. I don't mean one guy spoke this language, one that language, one that. And they sent the gospel all around the world. TBN did. Now, not everything they were preaching was great. Uh, they got a little bit too much into prosperity for me. But nonetheless... Uh, they taught that you got to be born again. And that's the part that gets you to heaven. A lot of people get saved in some of these countries. And just like the people Paul's writing to, their lives are at risk. Now here are some of these who are just being persecuted, beaten and stuff. In some countries, you don't just get beaten. If they catch you, they kill you. Pure and simple. So, so far, the biggest persecution of Christian faiths in America is hatred from people who don't like the things you stand for. Now, am I saying no Christian's ever been killed in America for the faith? Of course not. We don't know that. 
Some guy who shot somebody might have shot because they were Christian. We don't know, always know the whole story. But nonetheless, Jesus said there'll come a time, whether he was talking to the Jew or the Christian, when for my name's sake you'll be hated of all nations. Then comes the end. Now if he's talking about Israel, right now Israel's being hated by just about all nations. So in my mind we're getting close to the end. All right. So let's go down here to Acts 17, 1 to 10. In Acts 17, the first four books of the New Testament are historical books. They're Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're the four Gospels. They tell us about Jesus when he was here. The fifth book is an historical book. It's the only other historical book besides the four Gospels. And it tells us about the early church after Jesus went back to heaven. Tells us stories um, about what went in. Now there's 28 chapters in Acts, and the example I'm using here is past the midway point. Uh, Chapter 14 would be the end of the first half. Chapter 15, the beginning of the second half of that book, as far as chapters. Now I don't know about the verses. But in Acts 17, it would have passed halfway. Verses 1 to 10. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis, I used to never stumble at these. You know why? I realized nobody out there knew if I was pronouncing it right or not. So I just read them off and uh, uh, didn't worry about it. But as time got on, I find myself struggling with some of them. And the second one, Apollonia. They came, after they passed through those two areas, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul was as man who was, and he never learned. He loved the Jews so much, he said in one of his writings, I would that I could, I'm going to put it in my own words, that I could go to hell so the Jews would go to heaven. He couldn't stand that so many of his fellow Jews weren't saved. And that's how much he loved them. So every time he gets to another area, if there's a Jewish synagogue there, that's where he goes first. Well, the good news is, when he goes there, and sometimes they'll give him two or three Saturdays, remember it's a synagogue, to state his case, and some of those Jews will get converted. But in almost every case in the book of Acts, When he goes into a town, those Jews who don't get converted grab a hold of some of the converts, drag them in between the city leaders and say, these people are trying to destroy our relationship, whatever, you know, they were Gentile cities that had Jewish synagogues. Again, persecution spread Jews and they're always going to start a Jewish settlement. And just like it spreads Christians and churches are started. And um, so Paul was beaten so many times, arrested so many times, because he started off, if there was a Jewish synagogue, that's where he went. And I think, uh, as a read act, I think, can't you learn? <laughs> but the point is, he was so determined to see Jews saved. He didn't care how many times they could beat him up. He just didn't care. He wanted his fellow Jews to be saved. All right, so he goes, that's what happened to him here in Acts 17. He goes into a Jewish synagogue. And uh, a lot of times if they think, uh, uh, in those days of those uh, Jewish leaders thought you were a traveling rabbi or something, they'd invite you to speak. And uh, and Paul must have been given those opportunities because he began speaking. In verse 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. In other words, the promised Messiah. Some of them believed. Almost in every case, some of them believed. And consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. The devout Greeks, the Greek Jews, 
A great multitude believed, and of the chief women, not a few. But the Jews which believed not, there is always the problem. The Jews who thought Paul was a heretic, preaching heresy, those who believed not, in verse 5, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows. Remember Paul, or Luke rather wrote this. Luke was the guy who traveled with Paul. He was a physician that sometimes tried to keep up. Uh, you know, they didn't pray for everything. If somebody was ill, one of Paul's companions or Paul, uh, they also used medicine. And uh, so Luke was a physician that traveled along with Paul in his missionary journey. And, and Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. He wrote um, the book of Acts. And um, some people think he wrote Hebrews. Nobody knows 100% who wrote Hebrews. I think it's Paul. But if it's not Paul, it could be Luke, because it's somebody who knows Paul's doctrine. You say, well, didn't all the disciples know Paul's doctrine? Read First and Second Peter. You would never learn the deep truths of grace reading First and Second Peter. Don't get me wrong, you'll learn a bunch of good stuff. First, second, and third John, you'll never learn how to understand grace reading first, second, and third John. If you want to understand grace, you got to read Paul. Paul's the one that after he got saved, God took him into the wilderness and personally, through probably the Holy Spirit, taught Paul a whole brand new doctrine. And we want to know the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what the word gospel means, good news. We want to know what benefits are involved in the good news of Jesus Christ if Paul hadn't been converted, driven into the wilderness. I know it's uh, the Holy Spirit that was driven in. I mean, the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days. But Paul was also, doesn't say driven, but taken into the wilderness. And when he come out, God had given him and he makes no excuses for it. He tells Timothy, this is my gospel. He tells people in his writings, all those other apostles that traveled along with Jesus for three years, they taught me nothing. When he went to Jerusalem to visit with them, he enjoyed their visit. They gave... The, those uh, um, Jerusalem apostles gave Paul the right hand of fellowship, but Paul makes sure you know they added nothing to his message. His message came directly from God Almighty, I'm assuming in the person of the Holy Spirit, in, the, in the, uh, his own personal desert. All right, so uh, he, he just loves preaching. And the Jews, uh, again, when they don't believe, they persecute them, put that thing over. Jason was a guy who worked, hung around Paul. What is it with Jason's? They like to hang around apostles. This Jason hung around Paul, he hangs around me. <laughs> no support? Oh my goodness. I'm in here all alone. And they that troubled the people in the rulers of the city when they heard these things and when they had taken security of uh, since they couldn't find Paul, the other um, Christians got Paul out of there because they knew he was in trouble. And uh, they sent him away in verse 10. So, what's the sequence of events here? Paul goes to Thessalonica, verse 1. Verses 2 and 3, he went into the synagogue of the Jews. Um, verse 4, some Jews believed along with many Gentiles. Verse 5, the unbelieving Jews stirred up a large crowd in order to shut Paul up and have him arrested. Uh, verses 6 to 9, the Gentile believers hid Paul and endured the persecution instead. In verse 10, he escaped to Berea and went into the synagogue of the Jews. So it, it just... It, it, it just kind of tickles me. He loves them so much, he knows he gets himself in trouble when he goes into a synagogue to preach. It happens every time. 
But again, he said, I'd go to hell if it would get all the Jews to heaven. That's how much he loved his fellow Jews. So, now going back to um, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we have verses 15 and 16. Who both... Now I'm numbering some things here. This is... That number one is not part of the verse. But in the verse, who both killed the Lord Jesus, and number two, killed their own prophet, talking about the Jews, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and they are contrary to all men. That's verse 15. Verse 16. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they might be saved. A result to fill up their sins always. For the consequence, the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. So in the Good News Bible, this is the way verse 16 is worded. They even tried to stop us from preaching to the Gentiles. The Jewish people even tried to stop them from preaching to the Gentiles the message that would bring them salvation. In this way, they have brought to completion all the sins they have always committed and now God's anger has at last come down on them. In other words, they have ticked God off. These unsaved Jews have ticked God, the God they claim to serve, they have ticked them off. So there's six indictments that Paul makes against unbelieving Jews in verses 15 and 16. What does fill up their sins always mean? Genesis 6, 5. When God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's in the days of Noah. Uh, in the days of Lot, his uncle Abraham it's being spoken about here in, in Genesis fifteen sixteen. But in the fourth generation they shall come. Uh, in other words, God is telling Abraham, you're sojourning in the land I'm going to give you, but you're not going to own it for a long time. Your descendants have to be carried away into captivity. And when they get... Now we know, looking back, it's Egypt. They didn't go there as captives. Uh, Joseph became a favorite of um, of the first leader of Egypt, first pharaoh of Egypt that was there when Joseph was there because he interpreted a dream that saved Egypt from a lot of uh, bad problems. And this Jewish boy became second in command in all of Egypt. And so the Jews were doing very well for the first part of that 400 years they were in Egypt. But when that first pharaoh died, the next pharaoh didn't know Joseph. And he just looked around and seen these Jewish people just keep having children. They were growing more and more in numbers. So that pharaoh decided the only way to control them is to enslave them. And that's how they became slaves in Egypt. And uh, so this is all God telling Abraham, right now, Sodom, I mean, I have given this land to your descendants as an act of punishment on the people currently living there because I've had it up to here with the Canaanites. But their cup isn't full yet. I'm keeping track, but it's not full yet. And it's going to be over 400 years before the cup of my wrath against the Canaanites is full. And this time he's not going to send a flood or a fire and brimstone. He's going to send the Jewish people. And their job was to do what the flood did in Noah's day and the fire and brimstone did in Lot's day. It was to wipe out the Canaanites. But here's the thing. When God tells fire to do something, it does it. When God tells water to do something, it doesn't. When God tells people to do something, not so much. They left. They started signing peace treaties. They left a lot of people alive. And that's why we still got war in the Middle East nowadays. 
They didn't do the thing they were supposed to do. They didn't drive out the enemy and they were told to destroy them all. When they went into the land of Canaan, the promised land, their mission was the same as Noah's water was. Destroy them all. But it's harder for you and I. We can can you imagine if we were in Moses' stead? Well, Moses never really, he, he disobeyed God before they went over. Joshua took him into Canaan. Moses went up in a mountain. God showed him the promised land. Um, but can you imagine God telling us to kill every baby, every girl, every boy? That's the kind of thing they told the Jews when they went into the promised land. And we're sympathetic. We understand that would be a hard command to obey. That's why it's better when God keeps everything in His hands like you will in the tribulation period. It'll completely be done. The wrath will be fulfilled. So, verse 17 again. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see you, your face with great desire. In other words, easy to read version. Brothers and sisters, we separated you for, from a, uh, separated from you for a short time. But even though we have done this, uh, we were not there. Our thoughts were still with you. We wanted very much to see you, and we tried very hard to do that. By the way, there are some other notes there by some commentators. JFB stands for, um, oh, I used to know that. Anyway, it's three individuals that got together to write a uh, commentary on, on the Bible, JFB. Um, and then there's, uh, under that note about these things, there's a note from John Gill. And then there's another note from ChristianityToday.com down there. Now let's read these last few verses and call it a night. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Now, I always, you know, Paul writes that wicked one. Boy, i got to look that up. It's been so long now. I've quoted it a lot. I forget if Jesus said it or Paul wrote it. That wicked one toucheth us not. I think Paul, that's something Paul wrote. Talking about the devil. So Paul, if it's Paul, or if it's Jesus, if it's Paul, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write it, so it's the Word of God. If it's Jesus, Jesus said it, so it's the Word of God. So, here's the thing. The devil can't touch you. Is that good news? Yeah. Here's the bad news. He can't touch you, but he can stir up people to touch you. And that's what he did to Paul over and over and over and over again. Devil's got a whole lot of unsaved people out there. If if the devil wants to get Daryl and, and God said, no, no, you can't touch him. He said, okay, I won't. He go find some people that don't like Daryl. And then they gather some other people that don't like him. And they would do the devil's bidding. So the idea that the devil himself can't touch you doesn't mean the devil can't cause you great pain. That's what he did to Jesus. He stirred up the crowds. That's what he did to Paul. That's what he did to Peter. That's what he did to all of them. He stirred up, and we read it to you tonight. When Paul was preaching the gospel and made the Jews mad, they stirred up the city. We've got to stop this. And that's how the devil operates. So I'm glad the devil can't physically touch me. I'm not tickled that he can stir up someone else to physically touch me. But he can. All right. So he said, Satan hindered. So that's where, uh, under verse 18, so that's where I put the answer I just alluded to. Satan can't touch a believer, but he can stir up others to do them harm. Those who would do Paul harm, manipulated by the devil, would have loved to have gotten their hands on Paul. Verse 19, For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? 
are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming. So in the easy to read version, you are our hope, our joy, and the crown we will be proud of when our Lord Jesus comes. What's He saying? I'm going to be most excited when Jesus comes that I can present every one of my converts to Him. You're my crown and joy. Everybody I have ever won to Christ. That's what I'm excited about, he's saying. And finally, verse 20. For you are our glory and joy. So what's he saying? The thing that made Paul and his company have hope and joy in spite of their constantly facing persecution was when the word of God that they shared caused others to come to know Jesus Christ. Can you imagine how hard it had to be, not just in Paul's life, but missionaries' lives over the centuries, They get all thrilled that people are getting saved. And then they witness many of those new converts butchered. But the good news is, eternity outweighs this life. So somebody came in here and shot us for our faith tonight. They'd go out of here thinking they'd done the city a favor. I'd be thinking as I was laying there breathing my last, couldn't you have found a church with more people and done a bigger, a bigger favor? But the bottom line is, every Christian who dies, the minute you breathe your last, you open your eyes in heaven, whatever those eyes are at that time. Not the current ones you have, that's for sure. But you become instantly, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So no matter many people who are Christians have suffered horrifying death, but the good news is those who are Christians immediately went to heaven.